solids handling solution. I'll restart that, sorry, Mary. Hello everyone, welcome to MAPA's fifth and final webinar of 2022, Solids Handling Solutions and Optimization. My name is DJ Wacker, I'll be today's moderator. I'm a member of the MAPA Board of Directors, uh, sort of the secretary and also on the programming committee. We have three presentations uh, during today's webinar. The presentations are approximately 25 minutes uh, each in time. And then we'll have a question and answer session at the end of all three sessions. If you have any questions for our speakers, please use the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen during any time of the presentations. And then we'll ask those questions you know, during that, that Q&A session. Now I'd like to kick things off by welcoming our first speaker, which will be talking about solids measurements and control and dewatering processes. Uh, which is uh, Tony Guerra. Tony has 30 plus years of professional background in process automation, automation with Valmet, sharing best practices and technology across industrial and municipal industries. Welcome, Tony. Thank you. Everybody see this? Yep, you're good to go. Okay, good. <clears throat> okay, so thanks for the introduction, DJ. So Tony Guerra is my name. Uh, I'm with the Valmet uh, Process Automation Business. I've been with them for 30 plus years. I live in Western Canada, and I appreciate uh, the opportunity to talk about uh, this particular subject today. So the title is uh, Solids Management and Sludge Handling Processes for Water and Wastewater Plants with a focus on dewatering automation using model predictive controls. So some of the challenges that we see in the water and wastewater industries is uh, basically centered around sludge processing. So sludge treatment and disposal costs make up over 30% of the total uh, wastewater treatment costs. Solids processes are <clears throat> typically a black box where the process dynamics are unknown. Uh, measurements historically have not been very reliable uh, to accumulate this data and most uh, processes in the industry are based on manual controlled uh, using laboratory or visual analysis uh, typically based on graph samples for example for laboratory so time consuming and uh, not the most efficient way to control a process so the possibility exists for sure to improve performance and decrease operational costs by reliable solids measurements and controls. So the we talk about the way things are typically done today when trying to control a process. Some of the variables that we're looking at specifically is the, uh, the solids uh, concentration. And what this slide shows is basically looking at the uh, dewatering system uh, in this particular case, a centrifuge. And we're looking at the uh, <clears throat> solids concentration and the centrate stream coming out of the centrifuge. So historically, or you know, typically the way it's done in, in most uh, cases is the operator will grab a lab sample. You can see that bottom uh, graph. So a lab sample is taken at a certain point in time that is the orange dot so the operator is trying to control this process based on that moment in time well as we know that process uh, that one point in time is not indicative of what happens over a longer period of time so that process variable will vary solids concentration will vary so if we can have measurements that allow us to control the process in real time as opposed to that one moment in time uh, that is definitely uh, a way to be a lot more efficient. <clears throat> uh, specifically in dewatering, uh, basically we're using chemicals, uh, polymers, and historically a, we're doing everything by volumetric flow. However, polymer is dosed in pounds per ton. So in order to work with uh, pounds per ton, you should really be working with mass flow and not volumetric flow. So typically, uh, for example, on a dewatering system, you'll have a flow meter uh, feeding the system. And then by adding a density or concentration meter, then 
you have uh, everything you need to actually start using mass concentration and mass flow to optimize your process. So there's various uh, measurements available today. Uh, basically, uh, the company I work for, Valmet, has been doing this for many years, and we came into this industry from another industry uh, with, with some of these measurements, and some of these have been developed specifically for the water and wastewater industry. So I'm not going to go through all these instruments, but just to kind of showcase that uh, all, all the measure, measurements that are needed to accumulate solids concentration and the most criti critical processes in water, wastewater, sludge handling are available uh, by our company. So where do you typically use and where would you need continuous data on solids concentration in your plant? So typically there's a, a, a few different applications. In some cases, the ROI can be calculated easily because you might be using chemicals or polymer for some reason or uh, pumping efficiencies could be reduced. So if you start from the beginning of the plant, when you're coming out of the, whether it's primary or secondary clarifiers, if you're able to pump that, that clarifier based on solids percentage, as opposed to the way it's typically done today, uh, just using a pump sequencing on timers, the inefficiency using timers is that you're not really sure what kind of concentration you're com is coming out of those clarifiers. So if the uh, if you can limit the concentration, the low concentration, uh, you can be more efficient downstream by having a thicker sludge coming out and not overloading hydraulically uh, everything downstream. So that's the uh, a pretty easy and uh, application that just makes sense to start managing your solids right coming out of the clarification process. Uh, same thing when you're coming out of secondary, then it's a biological uh, process and you need to manage your bug population and retention times. And that is a mass calculation as well. So having a, a, a measurement there using mass flow based on that density uh, measurement available to you, that process becomes also more efficient. Uh, optimizing dry sludge to digesting uh, can create capacity. So the, the drier the sludge, obviously, the less volume it takes up. So you can basically uh, improve your efficiency in the digester, both in gas production and loading. And then moving on to whether it's thickening or dewatering, uh, whether it's a centrifuge, uh, gravity thickener, GBTs, and so forth. Again, we're using chemicals in this process, and chemicals are quite costly. And then as well, transportation costs to get that uh, dry cake sludge off site or to a third party is a very expensive proposition. So you can optimize this uh, process and that's gonna be the focus today. Uh, same thing, as I said earlier, uh, cake optimizing based on uh, trying to get as dry a cake as possible, uh, whether it's for transportation or incineration, your costs will be reduced. So this is a typical plant layout. This is the Oceanside plant in San Francisco. And it just exemplifies what I just mentioned about the, all the green dots uh, represent uh, a measurement that was enabled in the last few years. So we're talking about coming out of primary uh, clarification, uh, return activated sludge, feeding the digester, the GBT, uh, uh, feeding the, uh, the gravity bell thickeners, uh, screw press feed, screw press cake. So, this plant has been very uh, proactive and investing in those measurements to create efficiency across the plant. So some of the results that they shared, this was uh, based on a paper that was presented at the WEF uh, conference a few years back, but uh, just by enabling and, and improving controls based on those measurements, uh, basically you can see some of the variables that they were able to reduce and cost savings. For example, uh, volume fed at the digester decreased by 20%. So again, it's just based on having a thicker sludge coming into the digesting process as opposed to wet sludge, you create volume. Uh, you have the hydraulic load, again, by doing all this optimization upstream, uh, the watering hydraulic load has decreased by 20%, as well as a large decrease in energy use, mainly pumping uh, capacity in the clarification process has been reduced uh, by not having to pump for no reason and not having to pump wet sludge when you can enable, uh, you know, getting away from pump sequencing 
and pumping out solids, as well as when your hydraulic load de decreases and dewatering, uh, they were able to take a complete uh, gravity belt thickener offline in the thickening process, I'm sorry. So that's uh, another reduction in cost. So the reduction in cost by just optimizing processes based on instrumentation and controls are significant. That's just one example. Uh, so focusing on a on the centrifuge and uh, the watering process, uh, there is definitely some uh, optimization uh, upside to enabling measurements and control algorithms uh, when trying to maximize your and minimize your costs in this area. So if you look at a typical dewatering centrifuge, sludge centrifuge, you know, basically the whole purpose of the centrifuge is to remove solids by from water by way of centrifugal force. There are various streams coming in and out of that centrifuge. Uh, from the left side, you have the feed stream, which I mentioned is a good place for a density uh, or solids analyzer. So together in series with a existing flow meter, you start to enable mass calculations. So you know what the mass of solids as opposed to the volume of, of uh, the stream coming into the system. Then you have two outlet streams. One is a cake coming out. So that is uh, the thicker sludge that's been dewatered. And then you have the centrate water, which is basically the waste stream, which also contains uh, concentrations of solids, which typically would have to be reprocessed all the way upstream so those are the various uh, inputs and outputs uh, streams in a typical dewatering centrifuge. So there are controlled variables, uh, typically polymer dosing and differential speed of the centrifuge or torque are the two critical variables when you're managing a uh, dewatering centrifuge. So <clears throat> what, what this slide tries to show is that there is interaction between all these variables. For example, if you're doing a polymer change, so increasing polymer, obviously your centrate stream will change as well as dry, the dry cake stream will change in terms of concentration. If you're making a tor change, then your dry cake will change and your centrate also changes. So what, what this tr uh, slide tries to show is that there are cross connections between those variables and you cannot decouple those processes or variables and manage them properly. So that's when model predictive controllers come into play, which are made specifically for these types of, of processes. So a way I like to illustrate this uh, to some people that might be not be familiar with the model predictive controls is think of your thermostat at home. If you increase, if you turn your thermostat up, obviously you get more heat, but you decrease humidity. So one input has an effect on two outputs. So that's a simplified, uh, way of understanding a, a multivariable process. So if you look at the PNID, now we have these instruments uh, coming in and out on those streams. Uh, so again, you have your flow meter, you have your density meter on the inlet line, you have a measurement available to measure the solids on the centrate, and you have a measurement available to measure your cake dryness, your cake solids. So this control package called the Valmet uh, Sludge Dewatering Optimizer takes into account all those uh, measurements that we have available to us and controls the output values. So the measurements, again, that we have, we know the concentration coming into the system. We know the flow. So therefore we're enabling, enabling a mass uh, flow equation. We know the polymer solids coming in. We know the centrate uh, solids coming out, of the, coming out of the system. And we also know the cake solids coming out of the system. So taking all those variables, what we call control their input values, we're able to enter all that in a mod model a predictive controller, which will optimize or control what we call the manipulated variables, which would be controlling your set point polymer, changing it in real time, controlling your feed flow. So we need to slow, slow things down or accelerate things to, to keep the optimization uh, as efficient as possible, as well as controlling the torque set point. So using measurements into a model predictive controller, you can basically automate the entire system. It is a scalable uh, type application. So meaning what I just showed you, the complete package, you know, it takes into account all those measurements or the, you know, the more measurements you have, the more you know what's happening in your input and output streams, the more you can control in an efficient manner. But typically, uh, 
you know, an easy way to start is to just uh, use a density meter on the inlet stream. So with that into your PLC system, you can start optimizing polymer dosing in real time because you do know what's coming into the system. So that's the simplest way to do things. Now, by adding a second measurement, whether it's a centric measurement or a cake measurement, now you can now you can further implement uh, controls by having both the feed forward uh, strategy based on your what's coming into the system and a feedback uh, strategy and based on one of those two streams. Now you can take it uh, one move further by having uh, those three measurements. And in this particular case, we are able to optimize or manipulate more variables. So by having multiple measurements, we're still doing the polymer dosing, but we're still doing the flow rate, but now we can start also controlling torque. So that is the complete package. If you look at the kind of the setup here, because uh, customers will be asking, you know, how difficult is this to implement? So obviously, you know, a bunch of signals need to be implemented. So all signals are typically done to, uh, you know, typical normal IOs uh, to the customer's uh, existing PLC or control system. And there's also an uh, availability to use a Modbus to, uh, to get all those inputs and outputs. So there's, you know, again, if you look at those uh, signals coming in, everything I just talked about, you know, we need to know the polymer flow, the sludge flow, uh, the status of the controller for the polymer flow and so forth. So that is what the data that the customer's PLC is providing to us. And then we're, we're controlling through the IOs. Uh, again, what I just mentioned, we're controlling the set point of the polymer. We're controlling how much flow is coming into the system and so forth. So basically, uh, those are the various signals of, uh, that need to be coming in and out of the system through the uh, SDO control box. This is the operator interface, what it looks like. Uh, so basically, this would be at the operator station. And this is where the set points are entered. Uh, so you have, again, in real time, what is happening to the system in terms of input and output streams, concentration of solids uh, in real time. And then the customer can basically decide what is uh, what his goal is, or he can have one goal or multiple goals. So in this particular case, it shows that you know they want to manage the centrate solids and not exceed 800 milligrams per liter. They want to try to get the cake at about 20 percent, 23 percent. I'm sorry. So that is kind of their target uh, streams that they want to see coming out of the dewatering process. So by enabling the control package, uh, the controller in real time will manage, again, those manipulated variables to meet those set points. Uh, one case, this was one of our, our first cases over in Finland, which is our product home. Uh, there is the availability to do a ROI calculation before a complete Im implementation. So we work with the site to, you know, getting process data and try to figure out what estimate, estimated savings would be based on a partial or, or a full control implementation using those measurements and that uh, SDO package. In this particular case, we, we figured based on the data they were giving us, which includes, again, you know, how much operational costs are involved with uh, you know, transporting that cake offsite, uh, what their polymer costs are, so the better the data, the more we can calculate a, a decent ROI. And in this particular case, we figured at that point that they would be able to save about 95,000 uh, euros a year, which equates to about you know, somewhere around $100,000 euros a year. So the, pay, the ROI and the payback is quite short. Uh, so this basically just kind of shows uh, some of the things that were achieved. So the centrate water solids were reduced by 50%, which re resulted in a 10,000 euro savings a year. The polymer consumption was reduced by, by 40%. So from eight kilograms per ton down to five kilograms per ton, which equates another 49,000 euros per year. And the dry cake solids was increased by a little bit over 1%. So even though that 1% might not seem like a lot, it's a significant cost savings because they were transportation, transporting uh, that cake off site. Uh, this is a recent uh, case study. Uh, we have another guest speaker here, Rashi, that was involved in this from Corolo. 
So originally the, the intent in this particular plant in uh, Oregon, USA was to enable a complete sludge dewatering system. They did go as far as implementing the measurements. Uh, then once the measurements were implemented and proved, uh, the customer decided to hold off on the control package because they felt that just by using their own feed forward and feedback control strategies, based on those instruments, they were able to manage uh, the, the process as efficiently as they wanted to. And their variability in their cake was quite small. So even the cake analyzer became kind of obsolete because the centrate analyzer and the feed analyzer were doing such a good job. And their, their operators were doing a very good job of taking those measurements and data and managing that uh, dewatering system. So basically a small investment uh, resulted in, in very significant savings. This is another plant again in Finland where it just kind of shows you, you know, going from manual control for polymer dosing, for example, using the strategy, a feed for strategy, you can really minimize the variability by enabling automatic control. So the amount of swings on your polymer system, you know, from low concentration to high concentration, uh, you know, meaning that you're wasting a lot of polymer in, in manual mode because you're, again, you're, you're using that grab sample at a moment in time. Now having automatic control based on real-time measurements, you're able to really minimize the variability and reduce the cost of polymer use and use, reduce the amount of polymer use. So in uh, summary, uh, this, these instruments and control uh, packages uh, do present new savings possibilities by trying to, uh, not only trying, but uh, actually optimizing the dewatering process based on how it changes uh, on a 24 seven period by saving in polymer use, saving in energy use, uh, optimizing your dry cake uh, dryness, and also uh, trying to minimize the amount of centrate uh, solids that need to be reprocessed and circulated back upstream. Uh, for more information, we do have a complete uh, wastewater guidebook that we publish. Uh, what I just kind of talked about today is all in there in, in, uh, in nice color with pictures and case studies. Uh, you can download that uh, right on our webpage at valmed.com uh, backslash uh, wastewater. So thank you very much. And I guess we'll have questions at the end, DJ, you said. Yes, thank you very much, Tony. Appreciate uh... The uh, presentation there and good good timing. Um, yeah, we have a few questions, but yeah, we'll be holding off into the the end of the of all three presentations to to ask those. Um, so we're gonna get moving on here to our next uh, presentation, and uh, so that is biosolids cake pumping life cycle analysis: a true operator story uh, with by Avis Zadi. Avis is a regional sales manager at Swing Biotech Incorporated which is known as a market leader in solids handling for more than 30 years. He completed his master's degree in mechanical engineering from Concordia University in Montreal, Canada, 2013. Since then, he has worked on countless projects with world-known consulting firms to reduce operation and maintenance costs at hundreds of municipalities in North America by improving and optimizing their processes. Please welcome Abis. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, DJ. Um, good afternoon, everyone. As DJ mentioned today, my topic of um, the presentation is biosolids cake pumping life cycle and analysis. And this is a true operator story. We would um, we will look at the different technologies we can use for cake pumping or conveyance. And then um, I would like to talk about the many factors we should consider while evaluating biosolids cake pumping system. And in the end, I would, uh, we will look at the case study uh, we did at Bima County. <clears throat> and the authors, as I, uh, we mentioned here uh, on the first slide, the author of that paper is actually the engineers of the Bima County, Arizona. Um, uh, Hussam is the operator and uh, uh, there um, and they provided us all the information and the numbers. Uh, and then we will conclude, we will summarize our presentation. And uh, so let's start with biosolids cake. So, what is biosolids cake? Anything which is above 12% uh, uh, dryness, it is considered as biosolids cake. 
Um, and uh, this is very important, like anything above it, 12% is cake, but drier the cake is better when we are optimizing our dewatering system and when we are optimizing uh, our, uh, uh, our, uh, our storage and the hauling cost. Uh, as Antonio also mentioned in his presentation that drier the cake is better, either you're pump land applying it, hauling it, or even pumping it directly to incinerator, the drier cake is better to produce uh, for uh, less maintenance cost, for less uh, hauling cost, and also for the uh, gas cost or uh, energy cost for incinerators. So when we talk about biosolids transportation, usually uh, there are two main uh, methods we can use. One is the uh, conveyor and the other one is the pipeline. Uh, well, uh, conveyor is considered the, the simplest one, most economical one, which is true if you are conveying cake from point A to point B. For example, in this example, you're just conveying from this point to this point, conveyors are the most economical and very easy to maintain, uh, only one equipment to maintain. However, if you are, uh, if there are many direction changes and if there is vertical lift and if you do not have enough space to do the maintenance, all that uh, conveyance where pipeline is considered better because there is no maintenance cost uh, or maintenance associated with the pipeline. The only maintenance is at the, uh, like at ground level, which is the pump. Um, for example, in this example, if you um, uh, look at like this, is, these are the belt presses uh, dropping cake in this section, which, which can be cake pump, conveyor, but they want to pump all the way or they want to convey the cake all the way here into two incinerators and then two truck loading stations, right? So this is the top view of the same um, uh, site. Five belt presses want to convey the cake all the way to incinerators and then to cake uh, to the truck loading station. If their incinerators are down, they want to pump in uh, to the truck loading station, otherwise directly to incinerators, right? So if they want to go with a conveyor in this example, it will become very, very expensive for them and it will become a nightmare to maintain all these vertical conveyors and the con like the conveyor, this is a very tight space. It's going to be very difficult to, for the maintenance and maintenance close to incinerator is uh, not even safe when the temperature is really high and all that, right? So, um, for so uh, when it depends what is the application, sometimes conveyors are better, sometimes pumps are better. Um, but for the optimization of whole dewatering system, uh, selecting the right equipment is most crucial uh, and most important for the maintenance cost wise and also for the um, uh, total life cycle and uh, cost, right? So when we get into the cake pumping, mainly there are two technologies we look at. One is the PC pro uh, progressive cavity pumps and the other one is the piston pump. Um, generally, uh, piston pumps are considered that they are required for heavy duty application. For example, if the cake dryness is above 20% and if the piping run is more than 100 feet, then um, we should look at the piston pump. This is kind of general uh, rule of thumb. And, the, and the other, uh, on the other side, if the cake is not very dry, it's anything between 12% to 18% and the piping run is less than 100 feet, PC pump is more, more uh, suitable. This is usually um, considered. And one of the main reason why it is considered this way is the capital cost. It's because capital cost of the piston pump is higher than the capital cost of a PC pump. So when designing or selecting the technology for pumping, sometimes the capital cost gets all the attention and we go with uh, the PC pumps. Um, uh -huh. And another reason sometimes we, sometimes we oversimplify um, 
the maintenance cost. So when we do 20 year life cycle cost analysis or 10 year life cycle cost analysis, the simple rule of thumb is like three to 5% of the capital cost of the equipment is the maintenance cost per year, um, which can be true in some cases, but it's not always true. Uh, as I mentioned, it's sometimes it's oversimplified, but when we do this calculation that, hey, capital cost for the um, piston pump is very high as compared to PC pump, and then we do the three to 5% um, of capital cost as the maintenance cost, then of course, um, the 20 year life cycle, five year life cycle, or even 10 year life cycle cost analysis in, in 20, 10 year life cycle cost analysis, PC pumps becomes the most economical. However, uh, if we look at the true numbers, uh, actual data, that is not always true. For example, the true maintenance cost for a piston pump can be anything between only $2,000 per year to $10,000. And we will look at the actual numbers we got from Pima County, uh, Arizona. Um, and on the other side, um, sometimes the capital, uh, like the maintenance cost for PC pumps is 50% of their capital cost per year. Um, and uh, again, we will look at the numbers later. And, and uh, there are some other factors, not only the maintenance cost, for example, the downtime for repair. Um, I, I, have an, I have a site here in Pennsylvania, uh, like they cannot be down even for a couple of hours. So a couple of months ago, their dewatering equipment, they have a belt press, their dewatering equipment was down. So um, they, could, they could not use our conveyor and all that. So they were calling us to rent a dewatering equipment because they had to pay $6,000 per day hauling and the liquid when their bed press was down, right? So sometimes downtime becomes extremely, extremely expensive. $6,000 per day, meaning 50 or close to $50,000 per week if your dewatering equipment or uh, pumping equipment or uh, incinerator is down, right? So uh, pump, uh, for example, if your dewatering equipment is up, your incinerator is up, but your pumping equipment or conveyor is down, you cannot use that train. So that this is another factor you, we should always consider while uh, evaluating or while, while we're doing 20 year, 10 year, five year life cycle cost analysis. The next one is the break-in period. I was not very familiar with this term before, uh, but Pima County explained us what is that. According to them, um, I need to do some more research on it. According to them, for PC pumps, whenever you replace stators or rotors, you need to run um, uh, it slow and the cake should not be drier than 8% or 10% for a couple of hours. So Pima County had to run very wet or sloppy cake for a whole day and they used to pump it into their truck loading station and according to them it was extremely difficult to haul it all after every, uh, after every time they replaced their stators or rotors. So the last one, which is the most important one, the rating the watering equipment. Um, so it is directly associated with the hauling cost or the energy cost. For example, if your incinerator can take 25% cake and your bell press, your screw press, or your centrifuge can produce 25% cake, but your pump cannot pump 25% cake, this means you have to derate your dewatering equipment um, and uh, produce only 18% cake or 20% cake just so you can pump um, uh, from dewatering equipment to incinerator or dewatering equipment to truck loading station, right? So I believe that pumping should never be a bottleneck. Um, if your dewatering equipment can produce dryer cake, you should produce dryer cake. If your incinerator can handle dry solids, which most of the time multi-heart incinerators can take as dry as 28-30% cake, um, we, we should be able to produce as dry as possible uh, because it reduces the hauling cost, it reduces the um, energy cost. Um, so in short, I believe that pumping should not be the bottleneck. If you can produce dry cake, 
you should produce Rafiki to reduce the cost. Another factor is sometimes when you select PC pumps or piston pumps, any kind of pump, but when you're using a uh, pipeline, uh, if your pump cannot handle the pressure, back pressure in the pipeline, sometimes you need to add a lot of polymer or uh, water in the line to reduce the back pressure. So adding some water, I can understand, but adding a lot of polymer is actually counterproductive sometimes because you just dewatered from, let's assume 2% to 25%. Now you're adding water back into the line just to reduce the pressure um, and pumping direct into incinerators, right? So energy cost or pumping into truck loading station, you're hauling liquid now, so more hauling cost. So this is another factor we should consider. So this is the summary of the factors we should look at and then I want to get into the true numbers, the true example, actual case study, Pima County did and they wrote that letter with us, uh, sorry, the white paper with us. So just a quick introduction about Pima County. Uh, they have eight plants. Trace Rio is uh, one of their main one uh, that processes and uh, uh, the biosolids. They have anaerobic digesters, BNR, dewatering equipment, uh, and then they pump into truck loading station and then land apply. In total, it's like 30 MGD plant. Uh, however, uh, they have designed 450 MGD because they are projecting uh, that they will produce up to 50 MGD or process 50 MGD in 2030. <clears throat> so um, they have PC pumps, um, or I should say they had PC pumps, um, and they were producing approximately 12 to 18 percent cake, and the piping run was around 100 feet. Um, what they were doing, they were pumping from their dewatering equipment to truck loading silos. Here is the picture. So this is the dewatering building. So this is the pipeline going from this dewatering building and then going upward vertical lift and feeding this, these silos. And then this is the truck loading station. They load in the truck and then land apply. So this is this was their, uh, this is actually their process for cake handling part. So from 2020, uh, we installed our cake pumps in 2020, and then they had to do upgrade in 24, 2012 because they were doing a lot of modification. They uh, installed three centrifuges there, um, and then with three centrifuges, three pumps, and then uh, new storage silos and then new truck loading station. So they had a big upgrade project in 2012. And in that project, um, uh, PC pump was selected because it was assumed that it's less than 100 feet run and it should be um, good enough, uh, good application for PC pump which was, I think, true. Uh, however, they had to pay so much in the maintenance cost and the operators were um, very uh, frustrated that they had to repair that every uh, other week or so, or sometimes every month, every other month, and the maintenance cost was becoming very high. However, according to them, uh, me their main frustration was not only the maintenance cost, their main frustration was the hauling cost and, uh, and the downtime. So they could not handle downtime because they were processing solids for eight sites they have around. And then what they did, they had our old pumps, they, which they uh, stopped using in 2012. So they refurbished those piston pump and reinstalled it in 2018. And then they ran piston pump and PC pump side by side to do this study, to find out if it was a good idea to switch from piston pumps to PC pump, or they should have stayed with piston pump. And also the main purpose of this study was to justify um, uh, in front of their board that even for smaller or lighter applications, PC, piston pumps makes more sense economically 
and uh, because it's more reliable and downtime is very, very low. So here is what they provided us. Uh, if we, So this was the capital cost for the piston pump, capital cost for the PC pump. So what we did, we, they, just for uh, confidentiality, they did not give us exact number of the capital cost, but they told us that assume piston pump was three times more than the PC pump. Right, so this is what we did. Assume the capital cost for PC pump, piston pump is three times more than the PC pump, and if we assume that oversimplified rule, which is four percent per year for the maintenance cost, the maintenance cost for piece, piston pump should be nine per thousand, and PC pump should be only three thousand, which was not true according to them. The true numbers they had per year is on average three thirty-four thousand dollars per pump for PC pump, which is close to or more than 50% of their capital cost. And for the piston pump, they had like a record for the last 12, 15 years, they did the average that in total, it's around $8,000 for the piston pumps, which is kind of the same uh, from other installations we get the data from. So in total, just if we look at the where parts, the total saving per pump is like $26,000 per year. However, as I mentioned before, said so this is only one factor, the maintenance cost or the capital cost. Other factors are um, uh, like the hauling cost and all that, we will get into that later. So, but if we do uh, five-year life cycle cost analysis or 10-year life cycle cost analysis, the cost of ownership for piston pump is, very close to PC pump, even if we consider that the capital cost is three times. Um, so the cost of ownership is like 241,000 to 23,000, very close. But when we get into 10 year life cycle cost analysis, present value, the cost of ownership of piston pump is lower than uh, PC pump. And this is just when we are as we are considering maintenance parts, uh, like the rear parts and the uh, capital cost. So now if we get into other uh, important factors, so this is the picture like they refurbished in 2018 and they reinstalled this pump to start running it as a main. Uh, so, so other factors, one of the factors is the maintenance hours consumed. So if your PC pump is down only for one hour in six months, and your uh, and your uh, you have another pump which is down for two hours per week that adds up because uh, according if you uh, if someone is spending like one person or two person spending a couple of hours or a couple of days per week on for the maintenance there is a cost associated to that right and then break-in period uh, was extremely, extremely frustrating for them because they had to pump only 8% solids into their storage silo and then hauling 8% solids were not easy uh, for them. Uh, there are not a lot of uh, places that can take 8% cake or even less than 15% cake. So it was very difficult for them. So the next one is the hauling cost and the disposal cost. So they pay around $19 per ton. So for me, I'm the Northeast Regional Sales Manager. For me, $19 is kind of like free because over in Northeast, there are some sites um, which pay uh, close to like $200 per ton. Uh, last week I was in Massachusetts at one of the sites and they told me that they pay $175 per Done. And every percent dryness makes a big difference for them. Even for this FEMA company, if we assume 19% dollar per ton, um, their pump could not take more than 18% cake. So they usually pump only 13, they only produce 13 to 15% solids. So they have three new centrifuges, but they derate it and they produce only 15% solids. Uh, because if they produce more than that, their solids or their stators or rotors do not last for more than a month, right? So normally they can easily produce 18 to 22% solids. Um, so when they did the evaluation, 
they realize that if they produce at the normal rate, um, they will save 5,900 ton per year. So at 19 per, 19 per, $19 per ton, we are talking about around $110,000, $111,000 per year saving just in hauling, right? So uh, if we uh, count all these numbers, the maintenance cost, uh, hauling cost, and downtime, right? Then And now if we look at the cost of ownership, for first five years, it's like half as compared to PC pump. And the cost of ownership for piston pump for 10 years is close to like less, approximately five times less than the PC pump. Because now we are talking about the hauling cost. Like if you're producing 22% solids uh, or 15% solids, we are talking about 50% more hauling cost to haul 15% solids, right? Um, so um, based on this study, um, they, they realized that and they, they, gave, they sent this information to their board and their board approved a new piston pumps. And what they did in 2019, after one year of study, they ordered a new pump. So this was the existing pump, this was the refurbished pump. Now they're installing a new piston pump and they're gonna use just the piston pump. Uh, and they will keep the uh, PC pump just in case they have their centrifuge produces uh, very, very wet cake in the beginning when it starts running, right? So this is a, um, this was a true case study, which, uh, which we got data from them two years ago. And uh, we, we teamed up with them and wrote a white paper on it. Um, and uh, lastly, they 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 did they uh, did the Struvert recovery project, and when they did the Struvert recovery project, their dewatering improved, uh, improved, and now they're producing approximately 24, 25 percent solids, and even 24, 25 percent solids not an issue for their piston pumps. However, it was close to impossible for the piece, for their PC pumps. Uh, or even if they tried to pump 20%, 22% solids, their maintenance cost increased a lot and downtime increased a lot. So uh, they are extremely happy with this, uh, this uh, modification they did. So in, in, if we conclude um, uh, our conversation, as I mentioned that uh, we, we are not saying that conveyors or PC pumps or piston pumps uh, are good or bad. Um, what we are trying to convey is our, our message is there's a right tool for each job. So sometimes conveyors are the best options, sometimes the piston pumps and sometimes the PC pumps. However, um, while evaluating the technology, it is very, very important to uh, consider the true cost of ownership, which includes not only the capital cost, but includes the maintenance cost, downtime, hauling cost, um, energy consumption, um, and all that, right? So, and this is not only like I presented on Pima County uh, Trace Rio project, that is not only one example, there are many like that. For example, uh, North Las Vegas side, they, they did exactly the same thing. They just removed their three piston PC pumps and installed three piston pumps because of the same reason, same thing as uh, Petersburg in Florida. They are doing exactly the same thing, uh, removing three piston pumps, uh, PC pumps, and installing the piston pumps. So uh, I thank you for your time and special thanks again for uh, co authors of this paper, especially the Trace Rio's operations and maintenance team, uh, teams who provided us all the data and information, and lastly, the Pima County leadership. Thank you so much for your time. Uh, Please let me know if you have any questions. All right, thank you very much, Abis. I appreciate it. Um, yeah, well, um, I, I actually do have a few questions. I didn't see any others in there, but uh, 
but we'll get to those after uh, the last presentation, which we're moving on to that. Uh, so for our third and final presentation, we have reducing dewatering costs through an optimization program uh, by Rashi Gupta. Rashi is a vice president and project manager with Corolla Engineers, has specialized in biosolids management and wastewater treatment throughout her 20 year career. Ms. Gupta is Corolla's national biosolids technology integration lead and focuses on planning, design, startup, and optimization of all things related to residuals and biosolids. She's a licensed engineer in multiple states and obtained her BS in civil engineering from University of Cal Davis and her master's degree from University of Texas at Austin. She's a member of West WEF Residual Biosolid and Res Residuals and Biosolids Committee and serves as the past chair of the Solid, Solid Separation Subcommittee and is an active member on the Bioenergy Subcommittee. So please welcome Rashi. Thanks, DJ. Can you see my screen correctly? Yes, I can. Okay, great. All right, thank you everyone for um, sticking with this presentation today. And so today I'm gonna to be talking about a um, case study where we did a dewatering optimization program to reduce dewatering costs uh, for a utility out in California. So the utility is the Eastern Municipal Water District. They operate four different regional water reclamation facilities in Southern California. They also operate drinking water plants and a desalter. desalter. They provide potable water as well as reuse around the region in addition to the, the treatment collection um, and all the, the various infrastructure. The two facilities I'm going to talk about are the San Jacinto and Paris Valley plants. Uh, San Jacinto is a 14 MGD rated capacity plant, um, average annual flow, Paris is 22 MGD. They have similar liquid treatment trains, Headworks Primary, conventional activated sludge. They nitrify and denitrify, and they produce Title 20 to reuse quality water uh, from the liquid side. And on the solid side, they have uh, sludge thickening. They've got mesophilic anaerobic digestion, um, centrifuge dewatering with standby belt filter presses. So to start this off, um, the reason why we um, were brought in was because the utility was looking at its operating costs and determined that dewatering costs a boatload of money for them. Uh, this pie chart shows kind of a, a breakdown of operating costs that they were uh, incurring and for all four facilities together. And you can kind of see a few things here. I've got some basis of information here in terms of unit costs and things like that, but they we're um, averaging $3.7 million in dewatering costs for polymer hauling and, and power. Um, so that's a big number to them, for them or for anyone. Uh, the other thing I wanted to just point out is for this utility, which is in California, and they're paying about $46 a ton for hauling um, costs, their breakdown in cost was about two thirds for hauling, about a third for, and, and about, you know, just shy of a third for polymer with this very small component associated with power. And this is in California, uh, this is centrifuge dewatering. So oftentimes centrifuges get the bad rap about power costs. But when you look at the overall picture, the power costs were, um, you know, a relatively small portion of the overall dewatering costs. And when you broke that down and looked at the two facilities individually, it was something similar. Um, where the hauling was the big chunk, polymer was the second big chunk, and power was the smaller portion of the overall costs. So because of that, the district decided to embark on an optimization program. Um, it set a target, uh, not really knowing whether it could achieve it or not, of trying to save 5 to 10% on the annual dewatering costs across the, across the entire district. So that would have been about $185,000 to $370,000. Uh, to do this, they assigned one person at the district as their dewatering optimization lead that was in charge of this program for all four of their plants. Not an op operating, operating the plant, but just making sure that the optimization program um, was continuing and was getting attention um, and was being focused on. Um, the district also retained uh, Corolla to, to help them with this, but they also retained a third party uh, centrifuge trainer uh, that some of you may know, and we'll see his picture in a second. And so we started this program and implemented a formal optimization program that consisted of um, 
my colleague Steve Walker and I going to each of the four facilities and doing audits. I don't call them audits. Um, maybe that's a bad word, but basically we're just what we were just looking to see how things were operating, um, looking at the equipment, how data was collected, how, how what was documented, those types of things. We also completed field and um, classroom training. And then we recommended certain changes based on uh, what we found. The district then implemented those things that they could implement. And then we went about tracking to see um, how well that all worked. So of the dewatering optimization program, step one was just to determine baseline. Where are we, the starting point? So when we did these audits, we went and we looked at all four facilities, looked at the existing operations, the state of the equipment, um, how data were being collected and tracked. And you can see, this is probably pretty common for most um, utilities, that they were tracking things in a notebook by hand next to the dewatering equipment. Um, we looked at the equipment, kind of the state of all of the systems, the, the centrifuges, the bell filter presses, the polymer system, um, the conveyance, everything that was associated with the system. Uh, we looked to see if there was any published operational guidance anywhere to help the operators understand what they were trying to target. And then we also went through and we looked at maintenance history and how much that all ended up costing, um, and as well as how the performance of the overall systems at each of the four facilities. Step two was to provide field and classroom training. Um, and so this picture is Peter Lamontagne, some of you may know him. Uh, so the district got him to come out and do field training on centrifuge and polymer basics. Um, and so we were all out here at a facility, we pulled the centrifuge apart, we looked at it, uh, we did polymer testing and trials and, and kind of jar testing and things that you can do just even outside of jar testing, just to assess whether polymer uh, dosing is, is working well or not. And we followed that field training up with, center, with classroom training, where we went into some of the data that we analyzed in terms of where they were at in baseline performance and operating costs, the importance of such characteristics, um, and the bold items here I'm gonna talk briefly about in this presentation, uh, the unbold things I'm not gonna talk about, but uh, we can discuss them in Q&A. So we talked to, at length about such characteristics the impact on dewatering. Uh, we did talk about different pieces of equipment within the system, uh, centrifuges, polymer, the overall controls. Uh, we came up with a methodology for optimization. So they had kind of a, a plan to go off of. And then we spent a lot of time looking at and recommending different um, ways to sample, collect the data, track the data. Um, and the last bullet's very important, um, setting realistic operational targets. So if a target were set that was completely unattainable, that was not gonna help um, operations staff. Um, they would get, you know, as any of us would, we would get dejected and not being able to meet an unrealistic operational target. So we spent a lot of time trying to determine what realistic targets should be. Uh, so in terms of the training, I talked about how we focused on dewatering characteristics. Um, and you may all know how much of an impact that has on dryness and polymer demand. Um, but this was a while back when some of the some of the things that were coming out at that time was the impact of um, biological phosphorus removal on dewatering characteristics and things like that. And up to that time, I don't think there was that much attention being focused on um, how the such characteristics would impact dewatering. Um, so this was somewhat new to the, the utility and the staff there. So we talked about the importance of primary to secondary sludge in, by ratio, by mass, in the dewatering feed, and then subsequently on into the dewatering system. Uh, the volatile solids content, uh, whether a utility were actually implementing biologic phosphorus removal or not, the importance of divalent cations versus monovalent cations, um, and then sludge feed temperature. And over here on the right, you can actually see a graph of the four facilities. And the one plant that had the highest um, uh, primary sludge in its feed, which was the second plant, which was actually San Jacinto, you can see that it had the, the driest cake, which is the green column, and the lowest polymer dose of the utilities. And this utility was missing its data at the time, so it wasn't shown. 
but that just shows kind of graphically the importance of that primary sludge element um, and that overall ratio. The next part of the training was regarding polymer. And there's a whole lot of puzzle pieces in the polymer puzzle. Um, and we focused on many different things, including selecting and procuring the right polymer. And um, we talked to them about dilution concentration, activating fully the right polymer injection location, making sure we've got the right water pressure for dilution, the water characteristics, and how to go about optimizing polymer dose. Um, but selecting and procuring the right polymer is something that every utility has to do, and it's sometimes not given that much attention. But maintaining flexibility in that contract is really crucial for risk mitigation, process changes, and cost control. Um, I think we, you, you, may, you may be aware that all of our polymer manufacturing in the United States is, is located and concentrated um, in large part in the Southeast. And so when something like a hurricane comes through or there's just some sort of supply disruption, um, it can have a huge impact on plants across the country. And so we worked with them to establish primary and alternate suppliers using two different suppliers so that they weren't stuck um, without polymer. And then we also worked with them to see if we could have um, different polymers available depending on seasonal changes. So emulsion being potentially more cost-effective in the winter months and dry being more cost-effective in other months. Um, continuing on to the, with the training, we talked um, and went through the importance of different centrifuge operating parameters that can impact performance uh, with the focus being on loading rates. So the throughput through the machines. We also talked about all the other things we typically look at when we're optimizing the bowl speed, the uh, conveyor, speed and torque, the, the placement of the weir depths for the pond depth um, inside the machine. But the loading rates are very critical and it's important for everyone to, to track that, which goes back to what Tony was talking about uh, related to the, the different and the changes in the sludge characteristics and how that has an impact on what you're actually pushing through the machine. So you can see here, the, the loading rate on the left-hand graph is dryness versus solids loading. Um, solids loading being on the y axis. So when we're going up, that's higher loading, um, cake dryness being on the x axis. So for this machine, which was rated at 1500 pounds per hour, um, you know, we could see that when we were significantly below that, that's when we were getting the, the better performance in the machine. And then similarly for polymer dose, here the solids loading is on the x axis and polymer dose is on the y. Um, at the lower loading rates, you had lower polymer required um, than at the higher loading rates. So step three, um, our team identified ways to improve performance. Um, we recommended modifications focused on four different parameters. So one was focusing on such uh, characteristics which included tracking and monitoring the primary secondary ratio, all to solids, um, trying to operate the primaries um, to increase the polymer, the primary sludge load um, quickly out of the primaries into the, the uh, dewatering system, digestion and dewatering system. Second, uh, we focused on polymer. Third, we focused on systematic centrifuge optimization. Um, and lastly, we talked about performance tracking and monitoring. And that really was basically replacing that manual data entry of the red books, which is what they were called, with standardized electronic tracking, simple Excel spreadsheets, nothing too fancy. Uh, and we also talked about the appropriate ways to sample. The district took our recommendations and acted on those that they could very quickly. Um, so they started conducting systematic optimization of the system to determine that operational baseline. Um, we addressed longstanding maintenance issues with the polymer and the control systems. And this was actually, a lot of this discussion is actually about people, um, not equipment. It's relationships, it's management, it's making sure that the maintenance staff are on board with the things that the operations staff are on and everyone is pulling the rope in the same direction, which was an issue and was helped by having a third party come in and kind of um, provide reasoning for why the, the long-standing maintenance issues needed to be addressed. 
We also added load cells for polymer totes and tracking um, of the consumption at SCADA so that they used to actually just use a ruler on totes to track kind of the inches of polymer being um, consumed. And we went away from that by adding actual load cells into the system. Um, we went through and we helped them start a polymer selection process to find the right polymers separately for their thickening and dewatering processes. Um, and we worked with their purchasing department to modify the polymer contracts so that they could have more flexibility and have a shorter term on those polymer contracts. And we also helped them um, develop an electronic tracking system with uh, inherent set calculations that would help them monitor and report. So that performance tracking was really critical to develop the baseline and to check to see what was happening in terms of changes on a day-to-day -day basis, um, operational changes. So we set the spreadsheet up so that they could input just different information about the, the operation for the polymer, the centrifuge. And every time an operator came in to make changes, they would mark, they would put this in into the Excel file and they could keep track of what was happening and who was working on what um, to understand kind of impacts day to day of these different changes. Uh, in that same spreadsheet, we put in information as to why this information was being tracked, why it was important for, for the information to be put in there so that the operators understood why um, this was being asked of them uh, and that it was important to put in accurate information. The, the system then um, allowed them to put centrifuge information in for the actual performance of the equipment, um, as well as lab results. And then it calculated um, information about the solids production and polymer consumption automatically. And we had daily information. So those calculations were then converted into daily data and then seven day moving averages and 30 day moving averages that were then graphed so that the, the staff could see what was happening graphically. Uh, and we had the information also go in and provide costs so that they could see from a dollar standpoint how much things were gonna cost uh, based on the different changes that they were seeing. So after all of that, San Jacinto and Paris, their, their operations and maintenance staff really dug into the details. So their facility managers actively supported all of this work um, they were very diligent in their data tracking and, and input. They put, pulled together monthly summary sheets and they posted them in kind of the lunchroom where everyone could see um, what was happening. The supervisors met daily with the dewatering um, staff to talk about what had happened the day before, what sort of changes might occur, uh, and really just focused on the importance of dewatering. Um, and they started seeing patterns and relationships and impacts of the different changes that they implemented. So first, they, they um, convinced themselves that primary sludge is really, truly great for dewatering and digestion. Um, so high primary sludge proportion um, significantly improves dewaterability. And um, the Paris Valley plant, all of these facilities, they, they thicken in tank. So they thicken inside their primary clarifiers. Uh, the Paris Valley facility was able to actually modify their pumping so that they, they still thickened in the tank, but they didn't leave the material in there long enough for it to start kind of fermenting or anything. They pulled it out more quickly and they were able to get that load out of the primaries and into the digestion and dewatering processes. And you can see here that the primary sludge proportion went from um, about 37, 38% they got it up to almost 58% and they saw this increase in cake dryness. Um, they hadn't been tracking polymer um, earlier, so we weren't able to track the polymer there. And then this graph on the right kind of showed something similar where the primary sludge jumped, the green line jumped from one time to the other. The cake dryness jumped from um, down here at like 21 up to beyond 23. Um, and for the centrifuges, and then similarly for belt filter presses when they operated the belt filter presses in the standby mode. The operators also observed and leveraged uh, the impacts of the upstream processes and some of the ancillary processes. So they found that when they had thicker digested sludge coming in from their sludge storage tank, 
um, the system worked better when they thinned out their primary, their polymer solution. So they reduced the concentration of the polymer that they were using and they found improvements. They also reduced the amount of time that the, mature, the digested sludge stayed in their sludge storage tanks where it would lose heat because the digested sludge storage tanks weren't heated uh, because they found that uh, when the dewatering feed was hotter, that allowed for better dewatering, um, probably because it improved the, the polymer um, incorporation and conditioning. And again, you can kind of see the improvements here. So this is cake solids um, jumping and polymer consumption coming down. So they really took a lot of pride in, in operating the system and improving the operations. Um, this facility, this is the Santa Cena facility, they actually were going through a major expansion and implementation from going from BOD removal only to nitri nitrification and denitrification. And anytime you do some sort of biological nutrient removal process, your dewatering ends up degrading um, with phosphorus being the worst, but even implementing NDN um, has an impact on dewatering. And even though that they went from, from a major went through a major process change, they were able to basically maintain their dewatering. So they did not see a degradation, um, significant degradation in their performance. They really were, were on top of it. And they found real savings um, that resulted from the optimization program. So uh, in the very first year after the implementation of the program, they saw between the two plants, they saw a savings of $200,000. Uh, they kept, they've continued to do this. And so then the next year they were tracking it and they actually had an average of $300,000 a year of savings compared to um, the time period before they implemented the optimization. And really importantly, they showed the other two plants. They have four plants. These are, I'm talking about two. Um, so these two facilities showed that meeting the performance targets is possible and that real savings were significant. And by doing that, they set an example for the other two facilities that the district operates. Um, the keys to the success at both of these two plants was staff understanding and ownership, um, real pride in, in what they were doing, um, making sure that they had the right training, published guidelines. Um, we worked with them to help them staff like key people um, for longer periods of time and dewatering so that they got more uh, familiar with the overall process and the things that might need to change uh, rather than having different staff every day. And really just all of that ended up um, developing an ownership of the process. The data tracking and automatic calculations helped them visualize the impacts um, and they were able to actively maintain those high primary um, low BS uh, sludge characteristics, and importantly, both the own uh, operations and maintenance staff did start working towards the same goal. The performance targets and the results were published and posted in kind of the lunchroom areas, and so that helped uh, provide recognition of operators that met the targets, and it encouraged the other operations staff to emulate that work uh, and to achieve um, better performance. And management really just encouraged communication and gave the operators room to test and experiment um, to get to the right overall solution. So all that being said, I didn't talk about changing equipment. You know, I didn't go from one type of dewatering equipment to another. This was really about people and um, data and making sure that they understood what was happening, what the impacts were, and giving them the freedom and you know, some level of responsibility to um, operate the, the system in the best way that they could. So the district has continued its efforts. Um, all four facilities have um, tried to optimize their, their dewatering to different extents. Uh, they have all tried to look to see if they can improve their primary sludge um, pumping strategies. They found the optimal polymers separately for thickening and dewatering. Um, they did enter into contracts with and build flexibility for polymer uh, procurement. And um, in the end, they found that they got, at all four facilities, they were able to achieve $1.2 million of savings over two years compared to pre-optimization. Um, so that's all I had. I'd just like to acknowledge the staff at each of the four facilities, Ken, Mike, Brian, Matt, uh, and my colleague, Steve, who worked with me on this project. That's all I got. 
Great, thank you, Rafi. Um, since uh, we do, you're speaking there about people, I guess one of the questions that I did have um, was, did the district actually, actually hire someone for you know, this program or do they take someone in-house and say, hey, you're now you know, assigned to this? Because I mean, a lot of you know, utilities are short-staffed and while they would like to implement something like this, they oftentimes don't have the resources to, to really do that. Yeah, they didn't hire. So they did find somebody within the organization that they felt had um, the interest and the respect for uh, from O and M staff to to go about and you know ask people to do things differently, and so they they assigned somebody that they were already had um, at the utility who had been there for quite a while. Gotcha. Okay. Um, we have another question for you, and then I'll get over to uh, to Tony. Um, nice job, Rachi. But question: Does Eastern still practice these nice procedures since the conclusion of this effort in 2017? Yeah, they they keep they've kept going. We stopped tracking the data in 2017. But um, Ken Tagney, who was one of the the people I mentioned, he's now the director of operations at um, Eastern, and he was integral to this work. So he he knows how important it was, and they've kept it up um, to the best of my knowledge. Uh, they've they've maintained um, the importance of dewatering and minimizing the operating costs. Great, well, thank you. That's all the questions we have. Oh, we might have one more, but I'm just gonna go over to Tony real quick here. Um, we can kind of bounce around, but uh, looks like uh, Tony did answer these. But I'm gonna you know read these questions out for the rest of the group, and you can go from there. Um, so this is a good. You know, from a practical sense of flow paced auto control, what if the characteristics of the sludges change, such as biopolymers, colloidal content, et cetera? How does the system react to this inherent change in the sludge going to the dewatering besides flow? So, if you, you, know, you answered this, Tony, but if you want to kind of elaborate, that'd also be good. Sure. So, uh, that, that's a very good question. And honestly, I don't have as much data as I would like to have to, to give you an intelligent answer. However, you know, we're, we're looking at solids concentration. So, whether we're talking uh, suspended solids or volatile solids, or whatever, settling solids, we're looking at total solids in the stream. So, there are cases where seasonal changes, for example, will, will, make it, will definitely affect uh, you know, the existing calibrations that might be there. So we can recalibrate instrumentation, but the controls remain the same. So that's kind of the answer I've got on that question. All right, thank you. And then there's another one uh, directed at you, and that says, uh, how does the polymer system, or how does the system know if polymer uh, is not being overdosed? So basically, operator will, will be uh, able to identify an overdose of polymer, mainly because one of the consequences will be uh, extreme foaming of the centrate. So in the measurement uh, analyzer that looks at the centrate stream, there is a foaming index, basically, which gives you a kind of a data stream back to, to the operator, indicating that the foaming is actually more than uh, it was maybe an hour ago. So that's indicate, an indication of over, over uh, polymerizing the, the sludge. As well, uh, what we have to keep in mind is that the control strategy is to use as much polymer and no more than is needed to meet the plant target. So whether it, the plant target is a certain cake dryness or a certain uh, you know, centrate solids concentration, uh, the system is managing the manipulated variables, as I mentioned earlier, uh, one of them being the polymer to meet those targets. Great, thank you. Uh, Beast, one for you. Um, you showed, you know, all the different uh, costs associated with uh, maintenance, as well as, you know, hauling and, um, you know, you know uh, downtime costs and, and things of that nature. But how about power? I uh, do not believe that you actually showed any sort of electricity costs and compared the, the PC pump to the piston pump there. Yeah, it's a very good question. Um, the power, uh, when we talk about the pumping, is usually kind of similar. This is why we did not um, consider power. However, if, like for example, um, if we um, use Rashi's 
uh, presentation as an example, the power is only 5% when they did the calculation for uh, the maintenance of polymer consumption or the hauling cost. So even for the pumping, it's the same thing. The main leads, uh, the maintenance cost, hauling cost, and the uh, energy cost in the incinerator. But the power wise, for example, when we talk about the PC pump and piston pump, the power is usually very comparable. Uh, it's like 50 horsepower motor or 75 horsepower motor usually. Thank you. Um, we have a question for Rashi. Uh, you mentioned thinning of polymer. What was this the same polymer rate in terms of pound per ton, but just at a lower concentration? Yeah, so they, they first they optimized the polymer in terms of the dose, the pounds per ton, but then they found that um, the thinner polymer solution. So if they were producing, you know, 0.3% polymer solution, they found maybe 0.25% work better or even thinner than that. So th that's what I meant. All right. Um, well, I'm not seeing any other questions. Um, so yeah, so that's all the time. I guess we, if there's no, nothing else, then that's uh, about all we have here for today. Um, thank you very much for attending and thank you again to our speakers uh, for these great presentations. We will be providing copies of the presentations as well as a link to the video recording of this webinar in the coming weeks. Our next webinar from EVA is Tuesday, January 17th, 2023, and that will cover a practical review of dryer operations and equipment. Go ahead and look out for emails and check the website for details. Thanks again, everyone, and have a great rest of your day. Thank you. Bye-bye. Right. Thank you. Good day. Thank you.